Okay. <laughs> this sermon's entitled, The Power of the Resurrection. We're going to take a look at some of the verses, some of the verses on this subject. The Bible has a lot to say about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we see this subject found in verse 13. Verse 15, verse 16, we see it all the way up into verse 21, where it talks about the resurrection of the dead. And the reason why there's power behind the resurrection is because to bring somebody back from, from the dead would take power. It's not something that could just happen, you know, arbitrarily or just happen, you know, by happenstance or whatever. It's something that's deliberate and powerful. So I'd like to open up with prayer and then with a few verses on this subject. All right, dear God, thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says on this very subject. Bless the listeners. I have all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the Bible talks about, in the Gospel itself, it says in verse 3 of chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Now, in order for Christ to rise from the dead, somebody has to you have power, and you know, insofar that they can actually perform this. And the Bible makes this clear, we're looking at some verses on this, that it is the power of God. And that's why I'm preaching this, because people need to understand that here. their salvation is performed by God and his power, his infinite power. So turn over to John chapter 11. Very common Easter resurrection verses. We're going to look at John chapter 11. And we'll jump back into where he, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And he makes a very profound declaration here. Okay, it says in John 11, verses um, 20... Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary uh, sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. So he's affirming that he's going he's to rise again. Anyone who's saved is going to rise again into eternal life. You're born again. You're born from above be saved, you must simply believe on Jesus Christ, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You know, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, to everyone that believeth. See, it, it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Greek, it doesn't matter who you are, if you believe on Christ, you're saved. The power of the gospel has saved you. So, you know, that Let's just turn over to, let's, continue, let's just continue reading here in, in, in John 11, and verse 24. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So they're certain of this. <clears throat> now Jesus Christ says, 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So what he's saying is that anyone who is saved is identified with him, Jesus Christ and the resurrection, because he is the resurrection and the life. Okay? Then it says, And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? What does that mean, shall never die? It means you're not going to die and go to hell. You're going to be risen, resurrected into heaven. You'll never die the second death. And then she affirms that she believes it. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Stop right there. Now, let's, where does it say that it's the power of God? that raises Christ from the dead. Well, it says it in several places, but we're going to take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and we'll start off with the very first verse. Because the, the Jews, back at this time, they were, not, they were not sure about, you know, and a lot of people were not sure about why Jesus had to come. They thought he was going to come as some type of, uh, you know, savior from the Roman Empire, and that's not the case. So let's take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13, the whole point of Jesus coming was to die for, for our sins. He, he died for the sins of the whole world. He's the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, John one twenty nine. So that, that's found here, right here in chapter 13. Let's start off with verse 1. All right, Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 reads, This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I told you before and foretell you, as if I were present the second time, and being absent now, I write to them which hereafter have sinned, and to all other. Now, he's writing to people that sin. He's writing to everybody. Everyone's a sinner. For all have sinned, you come short of the glory of God. So Paul's epistle is written to everybody. Okay? Everyone's a sinner. Okay, let's keep reading. It says, and to all other, that if I come again, I will not spare, since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me. Now, look at this. Which 
the U word is not weak. They were not looking for a Christ who came in the form of human weakness. They were looking for a powerful Christ. But see, Christ is powerful, even in this human form, and that his resurrection rep uh, represents or demonstrates the power. So let's keep reading. It says, Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you, for though he was crucified through weakness. That, what, what does that mean? He was crucified in, in, in human flesh, although he did not sin. Hebrews chapter 4, 15 says he knew no sin. He could not sin. But yet he still, he, he came in weakness. He came in human flesh. It said, yet, now look at this, yet he liveth by the power of God. So it's the, it's the power of God that allows Christ to live. It's the power of God that's going to allow all believers to live in heaven and have eternal life forever. Because it's God's power. Now look at this. For we also are weak in him. Look at this. We are weak. Believers are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Now, why does it say toward you? Now, number one, it says we're going to live. It's a promise of eternal life and eternal security. We're going to live based on the power of God. But see, this is toward people because the gospel is toward everybody. So the gospel of the, under salvation is for everybody. Everyone needs to be saved. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? So that's the thing. Anyone can be saved, and anyone who is saved, it's by the power of God, and the power of God is unending, infinite, and cannot be negated. So there's no way a person can lose their salvation. There's no way a person can add anything to what God has already done. It's a done deal. It's, it's paid for. It's all by grace. It's complete. And the gospel is toward you. It's to everybody. So if a person's not saved, they need to get saved. And the gospel's very, very, very clear. You can't save yourself. You're a sinner. You know, you need to, you need, you need God's grace. And God gives you eternal life. And the scripture talks about how he gives eternal life over and over again. It's not even funny how many times it's in there. I'll do another sermon on that. You know, it talks about, I am that, let me just give you a couple of verses that make that clear. Turn to John 6. God gives eternal life by, you know, by his grace. It's a free gift. But people need to receive it. You receive it by faith alone. John 6, we just hit, just hit a few of them here. It says, In John 6, 27, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. Anyone. Anyone who believes. For him hath God the Father sealed. Okay? Another verse that says he gives it to us. Um, verse... Um, Okay, let's see. Verse, verse 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give, that's him, it's, it's his, it's Jesus Christ, he's given himself, is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, who's he giving it to? He's giving it to everyone who, everyone who wants it. It's, it's free for the taking. No Calvinism. It's not given to the elect. It's, it's given for the life of the world. Anyone who's alive can be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And once a person is saved, the power of God has already positionally raised them into heaven. They're already, they already have eternal life. And when, whenever they die, if they leave this physical body, they will be in heaven that quick. <clears throat> and it's all because of the power of God. One more verse on this, verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, that's important. He's powerful enough to raise you up at the last day, and that's what he promises. To anyone who believes on Jesus, you're promised to have everlasting life, and to be raised up at the last day. And that exemplifies God's power, because that's what the gospel is. It's the power of God and the salvation. That's all I have. So there's a power to the resurrection. We don't need to take this, you know, you know, just look at this, you know, dismissively or tritely. We need to look at it, you know, this is a, a monumental, prodigious event. So that's why I, I want to preach on the power of God, you know, the power of the resurrection, because that's what Easter represents. You know, when Jesus died for our sins, he was buried and rose again. That's the significance of this holiday. So that's all I have. Dear God, thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners. I have all this in Jesus' name. Amen.